osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis. Let's start with osteoarthritis. From a 100 level perspective, I want you to think of osteoarthritis as degeneration and inflammation in a weight bearing joint because of mechanical force and resulting inflammation. So let's make this really simple. Two bones meet and there's obviously a joint between them. In that joint, you have cartilage, which I've shown here illustrated by those blue squiggly lines. Over time, under certain circumstances, when a patient has certain risk factors, chronic force is exerted through the bone and directed to the joint. After all, the purpose of the joint is to be weight-bearing. It needs to bear the weight of the force. Over time, the cartilage becomes friable. Once the cartilage undergoes inflammation, you get subsequent changes in the joint. Subchondrally, which to refresh your memory, the subchondral space is that bony area proximal to the joint, you get sclerosis. The term sclerosis just means hardening and thickening. So the bone starts to harden, the bone starts to thicken. At the same time, chondrocytes mediate further degeneration as they're recruited to the area surrounding the cartilage as part of the inflammatory process. Now, as this is happening, there are other things growing in the joint space. Osteophytes are those little bony protrusions. The capsule becomes thickened. We already talked about the bone becoming sclerotic. The cartilage becomes ulcerated. Now, all of this culminates in inflammation and the growth of new things in the joint. There's also new angiogenesis because due to the inflammation, the body's natural response is, oh, hey, let's provide more blood flow to that area. So with increased blood, increased bony growth, sclerotic bone, the capsules thickening, the cartilage is ulcerating. The net effect here is total inflammation in the joint, which makes the joint space smaller. As the joint space becomes smaller, you get further inflammation. And as you might imagine, it's just a cycle that becomes exacerbated over time. So here's a beautiful image. On the left-hand side, you see what a normal joint should look like. On the right-hand side, you see what that joint looks like in osteoarthritis. Again, the takeaway here, if you wanna keep this stupid and simple, is osteoarthritis equals degeneration and inflammation and narrowing of the joint space due to mechanical force. Now, with that said, the risk factors should make sense. Risk factors, your, your test is probably going to give you what you see in red here. The patient will likely be female, likely age 50 or older, plus or minus with obesity, and probably postmenopausal. These are the risk factors for osteoarthritis. What I want you to know as well, and it's a little bit lower yield, is that if the existing, if the joint has pre-existing trauma or deformity, that joint is more likely to develop osteoarthritis. And the thought is that when you have a joint with pre-existing damage, there's some type of abnormality that makes the joint more susceptible to inflammation. Now this slide is extremely high yield because we're going to compare and contrast these features of osteoarthritis with the same features of rheumatoid arthritis when we get there. So pain in osteoarthritis is usually with use that decreases with rest. In other words, the pain happens when you're doing something, it gets better when you stop. And that should make sense because again, osteoarthritis is really a disease of mechanical force and subsequent inflammation. So the less mechanical force you put on a joint, the better the pain should feel, which is to say that the pain is with use and it decreases with rest. Now the joint distribution in osteoarthritis is asymmetric. It's not going to be perfectly symmetrical side to side. You have random joints on either side of the body that are going to develop osteoarthritis. It's all about physics and mechanical stress in a patient with certain risk factors. Lastly, when you look at the hand, and test writers love to test you on the hand for some reason, the joints that are involved in osteoarthritis are the DIP and the PIP. Now that's very important because the joints involved in the hand in rheumatoid arthritis are different. And the way that you can remember this is that when I think of osteoarthritis, I refer to that as OA, right? Osteoarthritis equals OA. OA quite literally sounds like the word OA. And so OA involves the two joints that are furthest away on the hand. So DIP and PIP are the two furthest away, or in other words, the two most distal. And that's how I remember their association with OA.
Now, the other thing you wanna look for on your exam are the presence of these Heberden's nodes and Bouchard's nodes, which is just the growth and the inflammation, that nodular thickening of the joint in the hand. Heberden's node occurs in the DIP, Bouchard's node in the PIP. Now the treatment for osteoarthritis first and foremost is lifestyle modification. But if you're going to use pharmacotherapy, you would use NSAIDs, then acetaminophen, and in some rare cases, intraarticular glucocorticoid injections. So that's osteoarthritis. Again, before I move on to rheumatoid arthritis, let's just summarize it by saying that osteoarthritis is a disease of degeneration and inflammation due to too much mechanical force exerted through a weight-bearing joint in somebody with certain risk factors. Now let's compare that to rheumatoid. Rheumatoid, on the other hand, the pathophysiology here is that it's autoimmunity. So yes, it's also inflammation, but it's autoimmune inflammation. And it leads to the formation of something called a panis, and that panis is what causes pain and destruction in the joint. So let's walk through this because this is a little bit more complex. In every joint, you have an interstitium, and in that interstitium, you have interstitial proteins. These are just proteins that normally float about and carry out individual functions. Under normal circumstances, these proteins have arginine on them. But in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, there's what's known as post-translational citrullination, which is a fancy way of saying arginine gets swapped out for citrulline. So now you have these proteins, now with a citrulline, that the body recognizes as foreign. And when that happens, the body's natural response is to trigger inflammation. So CD4 cells become activated, and those CD4 cells do a few things. One, it kicks off type 2 and type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. The other thing that it does is recruit inflammatory factors like interferon, tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, IL-6. So in the joint, you have inflammation. In the body and around the joint, you have hypersensitivity. And the net response of the body is to form a panis. Panis is a fancy way of saying proliferative granulation tissue. Now that granulation tissue is inside of a joint. And just like we saw in osteoarthritis, in rheumatoid, a panis, which is basically a foreign form of inflammation, is now in a joint. So the joint is expanding, the joint is inflammatory, the joint is painful. So that is how rheumatoid works pathophysiologically. Now risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis, female, just like an OA, so that doesn't help you a whole lot on exams, but HLA-DR4 and HLA-DR1 are associated with rheumatoid, as are a family history of autoimmune conditions. So this is, again, autoimmunity. So think, what do you know about autoimmunity? Has more of a genetic association. Here's the same slide I showed you with OA, but now we're talking about these features with rheumatoid. So in rheumatoid arthritis, patients tend to have morning pain that decreases with use. So as they warm that joint up and use it throughout the day, the pain actually gets better. In rheumatoid, there tends to be symmetric joint distribution. So it is the same side to side, whereas with OA, it's kind of random and asymmetric. In rheumatoid, in the hand specifically, I told you test writers love the hand, it involves the MCP and the PIP. Remember my catchy mnemonic for OA, OA equals OA. So OA equals the most distal or the DIP, rheumatoid are the closer joints, so MCP. Both have that overlapping PIP involvement. Here's a really nice table that differentiates the three features that I put on those slides. I told you those slides are very, very high yield. So again, just to really hammer this home, because I believe that understanding these differences between OA and RA can help you solve maybe 75% of the questions. So OA, pain with use gets better with rest. RA, pain in the morning, gets better with more and more use. OA, the joint is symmetrically involved. RA, asymmetric. And in OA, you want to think the most OA joint, so that's the most distal, the DIP, tends to be weight-bearing joints. RA is going to involve the MCP of the hand and tend to be non-weight-bearing joints elsewhere in the body. Now, associated with rheumatoid, there's a few other things 
that you want to be on the lookout for that, that do tend to show up. One are deformities in the fingers. So you can see what's known as a swan neck deformity. You can also see what's known as a boutonniere deformity. And these just refer to varying degrees of hyperextension versus flexion in the PIP versus DIP. Because they look, one can look sort of like a swan's neck and the other like a boutonniere, these received names and they became test favorites. So they do show up, I would memorize this slide. Lastly, there are extra articular manifestations associated with rheumatoid. And this is important because if you're taking your exam, you have some, you know, a patient in your vignette, sounds like they have some type of arthritis, but you're not sure which it is. If they're giving you extra articular, meaning not joint related manifestations clinically or other symptoms, you want to move away from OA and start to think more rheumatoid and perhaps something else. So the first one is that you're going to get these rheumatoid nodules. They'll be in one of two places on your exam. So the patient will have arthritis and then they'll also give you these nodules. The nodules will likely either be in the skin or the lungs. If they're in the skin, you want to look for them around the wrist and the elbow. If they're in the lungs, this is referred to as Kaplan syndrome or it's a part of Kaplan syndrome. Kaplan syndrome refers to the presence of rheumatoid arthritis plus these lung nodules in the setting of pneumoconiosis and lung fibrosis. Because that's a unique disease process where you have rheumatoid arthritis plus lung nodules plus pneumoconiosis, it's named Kaplan syndrome and it's high yield because it's unique. So memorize it. Treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, two different treatments here. One is the acute treatment when there's a flare up. The other is long-term treatment that really every patient with rheumatoid receives. So the long-term treatment, these are your DMARDs, your disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. The big one is methotrexate. There are others, but just memorize methotrexate if you only have time to memorize one. Acutely, in the setting of a flare-up, that's when glucocorticoids and NSAIDs are used. Typically speaking, though, as far as differentiating OA versus RA, OA, because it is a problem with the use, the overuse, and the stress of the joint, you treat with NSAIDs. Rheumatoid, since it has that autoimmune component, you're looking for something that's disease modifying, i.e. it targets the autoimmunity. It targets the genetically based or the immunologically based inflammation. And so in that case, you're using your disease modifying agents like methotrexate. But that's it. Know the differences, OA versus RA. Again, just to summarize, if you're sick and tired of, if you're not sick and tired of hearing it already, OA equals inflammation due to overuse in somebody with risk factors. RA equals autoimmune inflammation in somebody with more of an autoimmune profile.